Hello everyone, I'm Greg Weaver. Welcome to The Audio Analyst. For some reason, I have been getting a lot of requests from viewers and readers about the details on my system and room setup over recent weeks. So today, as it has been over three years since the original tour of my system dropped at the end of May 2020, Episode 3, The Reference System, let's take an updated tour. Now, it was November of 2015, with the kids grown and out of the big five-bedroom, three-floor house, that we closed on a smaller, three-bedroom ranch-style home situated on nearly two acres in northwest Goshen, Indiana. Now, the move saw me leave behind my smaller but very effective dedicated listening space, some 11 feet 9 inches wide by 23 feet 9 inches deep and 7 feet 2 inches tall. Now, my current music room occupies the north end of the west half of my basement in a space that is 46 feet long, 13 feet wide, and 7 foot 4 inches tall. Some quick calculations reveal that gives me about 600 square feet of floor space or some 4,300 cubic feet of room volume. Now, based on room length, it will support the full wavelength development of frequencies down to about 24 hertz, with primary axial resonances at about 44 and 78 hertz. One other very important detail is that I have two different sized and asymmetrically placed archways that open into another equally sized space just on the other side, and they both act as a periodic vents. The result is that the room is amazing sounding and exhibits virtually no loading. <laughs> In fact, during a visit to install and set up my Von Schweikert Audio Ultra 9s, Leif Swanson, chief designer at Von Schweikert, spent some time walking from my listening chair to the fireplace at the south wall, then back several times, shaking his head all the while, he announced, you seem to have some pretty cool things taking place with this room. Good length through base waves and those doorways. I noticed very little change to the base walking around the room. You definitely scored with this room. Now, to further manage the room, I have installed Michael Green audio corner tunes in each of the ceiling corners and two echo tunes, each positioned on the ceiling at the reflection point between the tweeter in my listening position. I've added two six foot by four foot RLX wall absorber panels at the speaker's primary and secondary reflection points on the side walls, and a pair of ATS acoustic corner bass traps in each corner of the front and side walls. Now, before I set up the system, I had some electrical work done, including the installation of an entirely new home grounding system to minimize the chance of any unnecessary noise or grunge riding on the AC lines. I also had two new dedicated entrances run from the main electrical service panel, one 20 amp run for the amplifiers and one 15 amp for the sources. My current reference table is the Kronos Pro Limited, Louis Desjardins original groundbreaking analog platform featuring a pair of Contra rotating platters. This revolutionary platter arrangement eliminates the negative impact of torsional forces experienced by any single platter turntable design. Because the opposing torques from the pair of platters effectively cancel each other, the elimination of torque unloads the torsional forces that would otherwise be loaded in the turntable's suspension system, which allows for the unleashing of a wealth of fine detail, tonal purity, and resolution that were previously unobtainable. This affords more faithful mid-range tonality and greater dynamic expressiveness, especially in the micro realm, than any other turntable I have heard save for the new sui generis Discovery platform. The table is powered by the Super Capacitor Power Supply 1. Two banks of super caps are set up so that one bank drives the two motors while the other is charging and automatically reverses those roles when necessary so the motors never see AC from the wall. My tone arm is another game-changing creation from Kronos, the Discovery RS, or Resonance Suppression, tone arm. Now, its design leverages both proven strategies with the implementation of some very fresh 
and innovative approaches applied globally to this new arm wand and pivot assembly, drastically interrupting resonances. Now, my cartridge is the hand-built Etsuro Gold, a moving coil model using a finely polished 80 micron microline profile stylus mounted on a 22 one hundredths of a millimeter thick diamond cantilever. Its rigid Duralumin body is coated with 24K pure traditional gold leaf foil, roughly one to two ten thousandths of a millimeter thick, and Yurushi, the whitish rubber tree-like sap used in the traditional Japanese lacquering process to significantly reduce unwanted resonance. Now, you'll also see a vintage MicroSeeky DD30 turntable here, fitted with a vintage, uh, well, late 80s uh, Monster Cable Sigma Genesis 2000 moving coil cartridge. Now, the Monster Cable carts were a collaboration between designer Hisiyoshi Nakatsuka and Namiki Precision Jewel Company. Nakatsuka-san went on to work for Ortofon, designed the AccuPhase branded carts, and is now the president and chief designer at ZYX. A meter and a half long Stealth Audio Helios phono cable makes the connection from the Kronos Pro LE to my Dynamic Sounds Associates Phono 3, a spectacularly versatile and world-class phono stage. It includes a remote control that allows for muting, display brightness adjustment, polarity inversion, cartridge loading, and gain changes, all from your listening chair. It has three inputs that accept either single-ended or balanced inputs. It is connected to the line stage via a meter and a half long Stealth Audio Sakura V17 limited edition XLR interconnect. Now, Stealth Sakura cables are directional as they are conical in geometry, inside and out, and they feature Stealth's new Veracross geometry, uh, where the cross sections of the cable varies along its length to improve the impedance matching between the source output and the chosen input device. My current digital source is the three-piece Ideon Absolute Suite from Greece. Now, the stream is unique in that it uses what they are calling real-time core playback. When you send the command to play a song, it is then uploaded into the memory directly, fully prioritized for audio playback, with no latency, buffering, interpolation, or resampling prior to playback. To my knowledge, this live core kernel playback methodology is the first and only such real-time kernel-based operation streamer available today. The US output from the stream then goes to the absolute time via a meter and a half long audience front row USB cable. The time has separate electrically stable USB and coaxial inputs and features their proprietary femto clock reclocking circuit on an upgradable platform and an ultra low noise jitter attenuating phase lock loop supporting a 12.8 MHz master clock. Now, the USB output from the time then passes to the Absolute Epsilon DAC via a meter and a half long Stealth USB-T Select cable, a tunable USB cable with a sliding ferromagnetic collar that allows fine tuning the sound. Until you've experienced it, you wouldn't believe the difference that collar position can make. The Absolute Epsilon DAC set a benchmark for audio excellence with the industry's highest dynamic range up to 140 decibels in a 32-bit 8-channel DAC and is discreetly powered using 16 separate power regulators. With no capacitors in the output stage, it has a directly coupled output. It will play 44.1 kHz to 384 kHz PCM files up to 32-bit depth and up to 8 times native DSD. Because it is a certified Rune endpoint, I use Rune to stream Cobuzz. But the native Ideon software renders files more faithfully than Rune, so I use that to manage file playback. A meter and a half long Stealth Sakura V16 single-ended interconnect carries the output from the DAC to my line stage. Also, because I was a career IT engineer and analyst, I've chosen to build a Windows-based PC to use as a file server streamer. It is built on a Lenovo ThinkStation P320 CAD workstation with an Intel Xeon 3.5 GHz quad-core CPU running eight logical processors with 32 GB of RAM and a Samsung Evo Plus solid-state drive for the operating system. 
The computer is further optimized for playing music with Fidelizer 8.10, an installed optimization utility that allows leveraging, managing, and prioritizing a computer's core functionality, services, and processes. My primary streaming and music management software is Rune 2.0, but I also employ J River Media Center 31. Regardless of my chosen streamer, files are then served from my Buffalo Link Station 220 12 terabyte network attached storage system using a sonically selected Cisco router system and switches, and it's all wired with Audience Hidden Treasure Ethernet Cat 7 cable. I have also installed the Hidden Treasure SATA cables inside this workstation. My current line stage is the new True Life Audio SSP1. This valve-based preamplifier is a discrete two-chassis device featuring a 48-position stepped attenuator with remote volume control and uses a fully dual mono design for both the power supply and audio circuits. The circuit uses a pure Class A transformer-coupled single-ended circuit built around a pair of NOS 6J5 tubes in the audio chassis while the PSU-1 power supply chassis is built around an NOS GZ32 tube rectifier. The PSU-1 has two separate power switches and umbilicals to power the signal chassis. All source components are conditioned by the remarkable audience Adept Response AR12T4, powered by their front row power cable. The TLA SSP-1 output is routed to the True Life Audio SSP350 monoblocks using a set of 20 foot long audience front row XLR interconnects. The True Life Audio SSA350 monos also take advantage of tube rectification, also using another NOS GZ32, and offer a single ended tube stage using NOS 6J5s to drive an ultra linear solid state stage followed by a bipolar transistor-based current amplifier that delivers the final power to the loudspeaker. Each of them rests atop a Grand Prix Audio Monaco amp stand, which are fitted with their flagship formula shelves. The amplifiers are connected to my Von Schweikert Audio Ultra 9s with an 8-foot set of Stealth Audio Dream V14 loudspeaker cables resting on the AudioNet Gauss cable risers with spades at both ends. Now, the Dream V14s also use the tunable approach with a sliding ferromagnetic collar that allows fine tuning of the sound. And I often count on the remarkable contributions of an 8 foot set of Silversmith Audio Fidelium speaker cables. But the Stealth Dreams make a more coherent, controlled match with the TLA amplifiers, so that's what's in play today. The Ultra 9s are a six way eight driver sealed enclosure dynamic loudspeaker and are essentially the lower half of the Ultra 11. From the front of the enclosure we see two modified Accuton 8 inch honeycomb ceramic drivers that cover the 50 to 250 hertz region. A unique Accuton 7 inch ceramic mid-range driver that reproduces the 250 to 2200 hertz range a modified ScanSpeak 1-inch beryllium dome diaphragm tweeter that covers from 2,200 to 20,000 Hz, and a bespoke Fontech 5-inch hybrid aluminum ribbon super tweeter whose bandwidth begins at 20,000 Hz and extends up past 60 kHz. Now, moving to the top of the rear baffle, we find the exclusive Von Schweikert Audio Ambience Retriever Driver Array featuring a second 5-inch aluminum Fontech Leaf Super Tweeter and a 1-inch Ciaz Aluminum Magnesium Alloy Dome Tweeter immediately beneath it, which are driven by a highly unique signal covering a bandwidth from roughly 2000 Hz to 60 kHz. Moving to the very bottom of the much wider back baffle, we find a one-piece Nomex Honeycomb 15-inch subwoofer, which recreates everything from 50 Hz down. Now, between the drivers, we find a large silver aluminum plate housing a custom-built 1,000-watt mono amplifier to power the 15-inch sub and the full-room integration suite of controls, as well as all cabling connections. The top two rows of controls feature three large Fostex 100-watt transformer-type attenuators to manage the room interactions of the tweeters, the super tweeters, and the rear ambience array. 
The lower row of potentiometers is used to integrate the subwoofer into the room, allowing for variable phase from 0 to 180 degrees, not 0 or 180, its flex point and its overall gain. Now, the Ultra 9s have recently been upgraded to rest on critical mass systems designed VSA Center Stage 2 LS footers. And finally, virtually all components, save for the turntables, rest on versions of the critical mass systems Center Stage 2 M footers, and all the components, including the foundation amplifiers and the Ultra 9s, are powered using various audience front row AC cables. Now, one of the reasons I created my companion webpage some 20 years ago was to answer as many questions about my system components and room setup as possible. Now, I've included a link to my website and to many episodes covering materials related to and touched upon in today's episode in today's description. If you have further questions, please look to those resources for the answers. Now, next week, while I'm attending the Pacific Audio Fest in Seattle, I'll be sharing system recordings of the system in play on both the analog and digital front ends using the same track for your amusement. Guys, thanks for dropping in today. Information on supporting the channel may be found in today's description section or at my website, theaudioanalyst.com. Please stay safe and keep the music playing. Till next time, cheers. <laughs>